I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. So I know Raleigh Weaver or Roy Weaver, I call him, from the chess world. We're actually playing a, an intense chess match to the death. We're about 18 games in, 9-9. Nine, nine. But he started telling me his story. And basically when he had just graduated college with zero dollars to his name, nothing at all. He did his first real estate transaction. How he did it is unbelievable. And you'll listen to his story. And then leveraging off of that, he did his next real estate deal. Then his next real estate deal, again, starting from scratch and just always figuring out how to pay his bills and then take profits from a deal and put it into the next deal. He bought his first property where he was able to rent out. And then the second and the third. And he describes exactly how he did it. I asked him specifically, can a young person do this today? And by the way, Roy is, is pretty young himself. And he describes exactly how a young person could do it today. So think of this as a step-by-step -step guide to building literally your own real estate empire. And I'm very impressed. Here's his story. And there's a lot of inspirational stuff in there to how he kept himself motivated even when times were tough. I'll leave it to him to tell a story. Here he is. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. So, Roy, you're going to tell us how you have, you have basically this mini real estate empire going on that you started totally from scratch, like with zero dollars. Yeah, absolutely zero dollars. <laughs> like what was the situation going on in your life when you first started dabbling into real estate? I just graduated college from USF uh, 2012. And I had absolutely zero dollars. I had uh, no school debt. Thank you, Jesus. But I'm looking at the rental prices. You can buy property and the rental prices in Florida. I was like, this, this is, this is a great deal. Like, so I started to get interested in this. I had to study it and whatnot. Well, what do you mean? Like the rental prices were suggesting that there was a great deal. Like, what does that mean? So like I, I research a stock market. I see where you can get, I researched these other investments. I see what you can get. And it, in, in Florida at the time, you could buy a property for $50,000 and rent it for $1,000 a month. Oh, so you're making like a 25% dividend equivalently. Yeah, so in Florida uh, in 2008, 2009, after the crash, things were rock bottom basically. 2011, 2012, 2013, you could buy 
my first property I bought for $51,000 and I rented it for almost $1,000 a month. But like, again, like not everyone could buy a place for $51,000. How were you able to do that? What I did to begin with, I would go to the tax deed sales and I would write a letter to every single person that had an eviction in Volusia County. So if you had an eviction in Volusia County, you were getting a letter. If you were going to lose your property at a tax deed sale, I would personally drive to every single property in Volusia County. And my reasoning was that if I can find these good deals, once I have a deal, I'm going to be able to uh, reach out to an investor and uh, joint partnership. We can wholesale, we can flip it and share the funds. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Yeah, because I still have a little confused like how you did it. So somebody was being evicted. Does that mean you would go to the landlord or, oh no, they were being evicted because of like tax reasons or something? Yeah, so I'll start with the, uh, the tax deed sale. So I'm driving to every one of these um, properties and it's kind of like you're faking until you make it. <laughs> yeah. For starters, I don't have the money to purchase this property. But I talked to a guy and we talked probably two weeks before the sale, a property in Orange City, which is right by Deltona uh, in Florida, right? Not far from Orlando. And I just said, hey, man, uh, if you don't have the money to pay it off before, just give me a shout, see if we can purchase it. Um, so you don't lose your house, basically, is what it comes to. He's like, okay, no, we got everything under control. No worries. I was like, okay, okay, cool. I had lunch with an investor on a Monday. And we were just talking, talking shop, basically. I said, I want to get into real estate. Um, what my name is. Do you have properties? No, I have properties. He said, well, okay. It kind of, I think it kind of blew me off. He's like, okay, yeah, keep working. It's like, okay. <laughs> and you're 22 years old. You're 22 years old at this point. You just graduated college. Yeah, yeah. So I just graduated college. And um, Tuesday morning, the owner of the property in Orange City gave me a call. He's like, I didn't get my money together. I'm going to lose this property. Do you still want to buy it? So I immediately called the investor I had lunch with the day before, <laughs> I said, listen, we got a property. Are you interested? And he was free that morning. So we drove there. We went to the property. We went in there and we checked it out. And we wanted $35,000 to offer from the property. It needed probably $20,000, $30,000 of work on it. Okay. But you're not 100% sure unless you really dig into it. It's hard to know 100%. Here, here's a question. I'm sorry I'm interrupting a lot. I, I'm naive about all this. Do you have to pay off? the other guy's property taxes to yeah. buy it? So he owed, I think it was $12,000 in back taxes, which is for like an investor, you know, it's not that much, but if you're a regular blue collar guy, it's a lot of money. So he had the auction started at 11 a.m. on Tuesday. And I know nothing. I don't, I don't, I don't know anything that I'm doing. I, I walk there in the, in, with the investor and he says, listen, I, we'll pay you 35 cash for, we'll pay off your taxes and the clock's ticking. And um, the owner said, no. I was like, off from 40, off from 45, off from 45. And the investor said, okay, have a good day. And we walked away. And we went back to his house and he said, he said, Raleigh, you wait. He's going to call us. <laughs> and 30 minutes later, he's starting to panic. The guy is. He says, okay, yeah, 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 35, 35,000. We make an agreement. The auction starts. And they're bidding for the property online. So wait, so you, he had already agreed though to your price. There's an auction still runs like the, like who's running the auction? Like the state of Florida runs the auction. It's the County. Mm -hmm. So the auction goes off and then we have these investors and we're following it online that are bidding up the property. What we were worried about was that there were some hidden liens on the property. Mm. So the County does a title search on the property and we're researching this. It, as we're researching it, they're bidding up the property. So it goes over 35,000, 40,000, 50,000, 55,000, 75,000. It goes up to $75,000 and we have to pay it off. I'm like, Michael, pay off the property. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I'm a hot mess because we have to go to the county and pay it off before the investor comes in and pays the uh, certified money to purchase the property. So we made the agreement with the owner and we're just making sure there's no sort of um, hidden uh, federal liens or whatnot on the property. But wait, the auction is going for 75000 Does the owner say, hey, I could get 75000 I want to back out of this deal? No, because he'll just lose it, okay? He will get a portion, but he has to know how to go through the process and get that money back. Mm. But it's not simple. Um, he's basically foreclosing on your property. 
And I told him, I said, listen, you can stay here for up to two months after we sell the property. No worries um, until you find your next spot. So he's, he's super happy. He's getting money in his pocket. Otherwise he'd be getting nothing. So we rushed to the, um, rushed to the courthouse and we pay it off. And it went for $78,000, the property auctioned off for. But once you paid off the property taxes, it, the auction's off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he gets a, um, the original investor is told, no, you don't, you, someone paid off the property taxes before you were able to come in. So what we did is um, the person that purchased the property, that was a friend of Michael's. So he gave him a call and he said, listen, you want to buy it for the, <laughs> for the price that you purchased it for? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. 78,000. <laughs> so we wholesale the property to him and split the difference between 35,000 and 78,000 and put the rest in our pocket basically. So in like one day, then you had $0 the day before. And so it's, I, I, I'm just going to walk through this and understand. So, so yeah. basically you found a guy who was the county was foreclosing on his house because he wasn't paying his, he owed 12,000 in property taxes. Yeah. And you, you offered him 35 plus the 12, uh, because you had to pay off 12, 35,000. Yeah. And the 12 comes out of the 35, the 12 that he owed. Correct. Yeah. So basically, okay. So he's like, his profit would be 23 because he, because, yeah. okay. And then someone else in the public auction offered 78. But you had already mm -hmm. had a signed, done deal with the guy who owned the house, who was being foreclosed on, but his buddy was willing to pay 78. So essentially, yeah. you paid this guy 35, paid off the taxes, and then um, there was another 43,000 to get to the 78. So that 43, you split with the old owner, and mm -hmm. you put 21 and a half in yours and your investor's pocket and you probably split that in half so so you basically you walked away in one day with ten thousand dollars about yeah when that happens it's a mind shift okay <laughs> yeah. when you can wholesale a property and make money like that because i worked as a lifeguard before making seven dollars an hour and um my mom was a teacher and my dad was a pastor so like, i don't come from this super <laughs> You know, it's, it's blue collar. And when that happens, you say, okay, okay, this is, this is what I want to do right now. And when you're 20, 22 years old, I mean, that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. That's I don't a think I had, money. I don't think I had that kind of money until I was like 28 or 29 years old. <laughs> it's like, well, this, this was the most money you ever had in your life. Right. Like, and you made it in one day. Yeah. Yeah. And so once that happened, I graduated college. I had a bunch of free time and I started every single property that had an eviction in Volusia County, I'm writing a letter to them. I'll print it off and I'll sign my name at the bottom. Every single property, every single tax deed sale in Volusia County, I'm writing, calling and visiting in my car, every single one. And so, so like, let's say someone owed again, 15,000 in taxes and yeah. you felt that there was value in the house, you would make them an offer, maybe a little offer before b below what it was worth. And, and you would tell them, hey, rather than risk eviction and then going through this complicated process, maybe the auction doesn't work out for you. And then even if it does work out for you, it's really complicated to get a portion of your money back. I'm offering you cash right now, no hassle and, and relief. Yeah. What, what you're offering them is freedom and security. And a lot of, it's going to sound bad, but a lot of these investors are just cutthroat. They'll go in there, they'll get them out the day of the auction. And if you sit down and talk to these people, they're just people, you know? And if you can offer them a way out and try to help them, there's a lot of money to be made there. So once I had some cash in my pocket, I started to um, just go after these properties like constantly. I'm calling people, getting yelled at, and getting kind of a thick skin, which you need in any business. And uh, my first property was in West Volusia in the country. And I bought it for $51,000. It was a, um, a property where it was like a first come first see, I think it was called the program where you have to be, um, like a first time home buyer basically. Hmm. So I got into this, they're asking 52,000. I offered 51,000. <laughs> Hard negotiator. Yeah. I just, I, <laughs> did you go in with your buddy who went in with you before the investor? No, who went no, in no. With you before? This is my, I went in a hundred percent on my own. 
and I'm 23 at this point. I rented out the rooms. It's a three bedroom and I rented out the rooms. Oh, okay. How, how did you get the 51,000 to, to buy it? So I didn't, I didn't. So you're probably familiar, but in the U S you can get an FHA loan to purchase the property, which is first time home buyers loan. And it's 3% down to purchase the property. So, 3% down? I never heard of this. 3.5% down to purchase the property. So all these people that say, oh, I don't have the money to get into real estate. Listen, you can beg, borrow, or steal, you know, 3.5% down. Yeah, $1,500 you, you, in this case. Yeah, so here's the thing. Here's the, I, I paid a little bit more because it was such a cheap property, but I'm going to go on a quick tangent. But sure. with the FHA loan, yes, you're only allowed to have one but you can receive as many FHA loans as you want to. So let's say John Doe is 25 years old and he purchased an FHA loan for a property. Let's say a year later, you're able to uh, refinance that same loan into a conventional mortgage. And once you're out of that FHA loan, what can you do? You can receive an FHA loan again. Even though you're not a first-time home buyer. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a first-time home buyer. It is a um, a low. You can't have more than one FHA loan in your name, but you can receive ten if you have equity in the property to refinance. Uh, I see. So it's incredible. Like it is. It'd be totally possible for any of your listeners to purchase a property every year and a half and refinance, purchase, rent it out get equity in the property and just keep doing this, churning it out. And once you have 10 properties, I mean, you, you can play chess all day, basically. It just, you can. <laughs> so, so, so like this first, so the second property, essentially, you found it, it was, you offered 51. You had, did you have the FHA loan in your pocket already? Like, did you know that they were going to give you the money? You can get pre-approved or you can uh, get it under contract and purchase the property. It's better to be pre-approved before purchasing. I wasn't. But again, the market was so, no one was buying real estate <laughs> yeah. in 2011, 2012. You're just shooting fish in a barrel, basically. I was the only one of my friends. People thought I was crazy. They're like, oh, you're going to lose all your money, all my friends. I was like, okay, yeah, maybe I will. But I will purchase this property. So I bought this property and I'm getting 900 gross monthly. And for me, this is like 15K. Like I'm, I'm, I'm happy as a lark. And I'm hitting these uh, tax deed sales. I'm hitting these eviction letters every single day. I'm doing this. So, so, so on, on that property again, you're getting 900 a month because you rented out immediately. Did you have to yeah. fix it up? A little bit. There was some roof work on the back um, I had to do. But again, I put the renters in there in the other two rooms and I'm getting that money right away. So $900 a month, which is like 10800 a year. And you're yeah. paying on a mortgage, a 3% mortgage on $50,000, roughly. Just not not much. <laughs> yeah, just fifteen or 1600 a year, and you're making 10000 So it's just pure profit. Yeah, and I have zero expenses. You know, I'm not married at this point. I don't have a child. I'm like, I'm saving every single penny that I get. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't spend my money on anything. And I'm, I have some money saved up also, and I'm putting this money, I'm bidding on the auctions at the tax deed sales. So in 2012, 2013, like nobody's bidding on these things, okay? What the investors would do is they would check out the Google Street View prior to the sales. And my strategy was that if I can go where the investors aren't going, I can get good deals. So I'm driving to these properties regardless. And I came to one property in West Volusia in Pearson. When you look at the Google Street View, it's all grown up, there's trees covering it and you can't see anything. But I walk in and it's a three bedroom block property <laughs> that the previous owner died, had zero, um, uh, no children or anything. It looks like a lot, basically. You couldn't really tell it was a house. So I bid on this property online. It's in the country, it's in the boondocks. And I bought it for $23,000 because no, <laughs> no, no one bid on the property. So, so like, what do you think at that time? Like, what did you feel when you visited it that it was worth? Like, what were the neighbors worth? At the time, it's worth seventy to eighty thousand dollars. So no one bid on it because they thought it didn't even exist. Thought, thought it was like a treehouse or something. Yeah. You 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 bid the lowest <laughs> amount, twenty three thousand dollars, and 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 you got it. Yeah, I got it, and I put a renter in there for seven hundred and sixty dollars, super cheap. But again, this was in two thousand thirteen. Mm -hmm. 
So it's paid itself off like four times. <laughs> so I still own that property to this day. What do you think it's worth right now? The Zestimate, the Zillow value, I think it's 180, 190. Wow. Okay. So I'm starting to gain steam and I'm like, I'm all in on real estate. <laughs> I will tell any of my friends, like, guys, you got to invest in real estate. You have to like put in the time, study this and get, get on it. No one listens to me. I'm like the crazy guy. You know, my friends, no one listens to me. And by the way, no one listens to anyone on anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I meet this guy. I would ride around on my bike and, uh, and drive, call it driving for dollars. And I stumble upon this sixplex in Daytona. It's a sixplex apartment complex. It's owned by like an 80 year old guy um, from New York. <laughs> <laughs> so he bought all this property right before, I think it was in 1986, the tax, when they changed the tax. And he was depreciating this property basically. And I, I wrote him a letter. I called him. We sat down and I was like, man, like, why are you, why are you, why are these properties all vacant? He's like, oh, I, I don't want to deal with tenants. Oh, I can't stand tenants. Like, so why he just leave the? I was like, dude, just sell me the properties. Like, I don't want to pay taxes. He, he, you know these old guys that like hate paying taxes to the government. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, this is like the epitome. <laughs> so he'd rather make nothing than make something and have to pay taxes. Yeah, he's like, I'm not giving my taxes to the government. I was like, all right, man, all right. I was like, listen, like I was googling owner finance properties. I was like, listen, if you owner finance to me. I will pay you a monthly payment and you won't have to pay those capital gain taxes right away. I will pay you monthly over a period of eight years. I will pay you off and you'll have barely any capital gain taxes to pay. Like, what? Like, sign me up. <laughs> so we purchased, we, my, my, uh, my girlfriend, now wife, we purchased this sixplex and it's straight out of the seventies. It has the shag carpet. It, ha it, 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 it is just terrible, but it's all like in pristine condition. So sixplex, there are six apartments in it or six rooms? Six apartments. Yeah. So it's uh, four, two bedrooms, two, uh, one bedrooms. And, um, and what was the deal? Like, how did you, what was the owner financing? What was the cost? Okay. So it was purchase price. Two, this was in 2014, I think it was. The purchase price was 270000 and then 40,000 down or 30,000 down, 3.5 interest rate on an eight year note. So, wait, you, you gave him 30,000 upfront. Yeah. How, how did you cut? Did you already have that money from the other real estate stuff? Or yeah, did you yeah. And I, I'm spending, I, I'm saving everything I can. I did other wholesale properties. I wholesaled a, um, a mobile home. I wholesaled on other properties. So I'm, I'm saving as much as I can. And by wholesale, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm asking all these questions because I, I am totally naive. It means you bought something, let's say out of the auction and then immediately flipped it. Yeah. Yeah. So I immediately flipped it. Because again, I just don't have that capital, you know, right. to flip these properties. So I'm using other people's money and they're making their money. Everybody's making the money in this transaction, which is awesome. So you use an investor to find a, a, a house that was for sale cheap on an auction because of the foreclosure. And then as soon as you and the, the investor would put up the money and you would take care of the whole transaction, then you would list it for sale immediately, sell it for double or whatever, split the profit with the investor. Yes. Yeah, sometimes you can do that. What I was doing though, is I was just getting the contract and then selling the contract to the investor, mm. which is even less dirty work of me. So I'm, my hard work is putting in the work of visiting every single one of these properties, which no one was doing at this time and talking to these people. I see. So then you would say to an investor, I've got a great deal. Yeah. I could buy this for 35,000 uh, uh, on the market. It'll go for 70. I'll sell you this contract for 45 and you take yeah, care well, of you. Yeah. Often, oftentimes I just ask them, man, how much do you want to spend for this property? <laughs> mm -hmm. Once they give me the number, then I say, okay, let's, let's do this. Um, so everyone is happy because you never know how much they'll spend. I would have whole sold that property and that I bought for 35, I would have wholesaled that for 37. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> you would have made 2,000 for nothing in a day. Yeah, for me, I'm like, woo. Yeah. So, okay, so I get this property, this sixplex under contract, and I put all my money into this. I, I had maybe $700 to my name, okay? So we, <laughs> we have to rent them out now, okay? So we started in apartment number one 
we tried to clean it up. We did all the work, my, uh, my wife and I ourselves, fixing it up. And um, a guy just walked in. He's like, you renting this? And I'm a little, I'm a little punk, okay? And this guy, this 40-year-old Mexican guy, just big jacks. I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> so I rented to him and shag carpet and everything. We don't have the money to take out the shag. It's, going, it's coming with the shag, you know? Yeah. So we get the first month and we get the security. I don't know if I should say this, but we use the first month and the security to fix up apartment number two. Okay. So we're just barreling this money into each apartment. Yeah. So we did this with every single apartment until it was fully rented again, using other people's money. So we have this stabilized and we're making over four, I think it's 4,300 a month gross. Right. So, so that means you put 30,000 down and then yeah. within essentially seven months, you're, you've made back the 30,000 and now it's all profit, you know, m- minus the interest. Yeah. And so we're receiving 4,000 from here a month from the apartments. We're receiving 1,600 from the two properties that we're renting out. Oh, one thing I wanted to say, you need pain. There has to be some sort of um, issue, you know, to get a good deal. Right. Like my friends, I've already purchased one property with a bank. Everything else has been owner finance or I bought with cash. And my friends are like, Raleigh, how do you find these properties? And I'm just like, you have to have some sort of pain. When I bought that six unit from the guy, the, uh, the eight-year-old guy that hates taxes, he said, right when I signed the closing document, he said, well, son, my problem became your problem. And he walked away. <laughs> And that's and, fine. I'll take these problems all day. But his pain also was that he was like an old man. Like he didn't want to have this house for that much longer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these old guys are really cool guys. Mm-hmm. Like they got some, some stories to tell. And no one, for some reason, like in our culture, in our American culture, we don't really respect uh, older people, which I, I don't really like. A lot of these old guys are just awesome. And they probably appreciated that you were listening to them, that you were visiting them, that you cared about the property. They probably appreciated all these things. You, you were hustling. Yeah. And, and like, these guys are hustlers. Mm-hmm. I mean, the only difference between like us and them is like 60 years, basically. These guys were hustlers, man, growing up. So you, you can see it, you know, in the younger generation. So I kept on purchasing, flipping properties and I got up to 13 units and I was bringing in I think it was 9,000 a month. Um, I think that's 20, 24 at this point. Man. And like for, to a 24 year old kid, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And also you had no, you had no boss. You, you were, you were living the dream. Yeah. And I'm sitting there. I was like, this, this is awesome. <laughs> like I could do whatever I wanted to do every day, but I started to get a little nervous because I'm a child of the, uh, the great crash. When I graduated high school in 2009, my mom lost $250,000 on a property she purchased. Wow. And I started a little bit nervous. <laughs> I said, this is not, we had like the quantitative easing that was happening in the federal government. They kept yeah. pumping money into the market. And I started to get really nervous. I said, this is not healthy. And I, I continue believing that's not healthy, what they're doing on the federal scale with the U.S. dollar. But I don't want to get into that. But what happens in a crisis? The sand states, California, Arizona, and Florida, they always crash. Okay. Why is that? These, because in, in the good times, look, look, look at the amount of immigration or people that are moving to Florida. Okay. It is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people yearly. Everyone wants to move down there. They want the good life. They'll sell the properties in other states and it pumps up the Florida. Uh, real estate market. The zero income tax helps also for very various reasons. So I started to get really nervous. I said, listen, I can't, I work too hard to lose this. But what's your worst case scenario? Because you're getting the rent money, even like you can wait out what, like housing prices when they fall, which is rare, they don't fall for too long. Yeah. They come back. Yeah. So this was my strategy with hindsight, you know, maybe, well, I'll tell you the full story. Then we'll see if it was, it was correct or not. But my strategy was that, you know, sooner or later, we're going to have some sort of correction in the Florida market, right? 
So what if I search for a market where there hasn't had this extreme appreciation to park my money, park it there, and then once the property, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say crash, but once it adjusts, I can swoop back in and continue buying in the Florida market. So I, I found North Georgia hmm. at this time in 2016. There was basically zero appreciation from the crash. It's a stabilized market. During the crashes, it doesn't go down. During the um, appreciation, it hadn't really gone up too much. So I found this, <laughs> this, um, this hotel, which was in Helen, Georgia, right in the mountains by the, the border with, um, with North Carolina. And I just walk up and I knocked on their door. I was like, why aren't you open? <laughs> like, what's going on man, with the hotel? And this 80-year-old uh, Southerner came to the door and he said, he's like, son, I'm just too old. <laughs> he's like, I, no, he was 89 years old when we first met. He's like, I'm too old. I can't, I can't run this. And it's been closed down for three years. I was like, man, do you just want to sell this to me? I was like, I'll, I'll, I will, I will buy this from you, and I will. You can stay. They lived on site, so you can just stay here. I will pay for your water, electricity, um, TV. I'll pay. How for many everything. rooms in the hotel? Twenty, twenty rooms. Wow. Sell it to me, and you don't worry about anything. Basically, I'll pay for everything. He's like, all right. He's like, I was like, you want to own or finance it for me? He's like, yes, sir. I was like, all right, let, let's get you up. So we bought this. And I sold half of uh, our property in Florida and we just barreled it into this property. Again, we had, I think, 3K left. We were trying to fix up the rooms and whatnot. Can you say how much the property was? How much was the hotel? Uh, it was cheap. <laughs> and, and how much did he finance? Like how much did you have to put down percentage-wise? It was 10% down. Oh my um, gosh. And it was on a two-year note. And... Um, I gave him 2000 a month that went directly to principal. Okay. <laughs> so we get this. I know nothing about the hospitality business. Okay. Like I'm nice, but I'm not that nice. I'm not <laughs> hospitality nice. Okay. <laughs> and so we're running this with my, uh, my wife. We have our son. Our, um, he was one year, one year old right now. And we open up. And, and Helen, Georgia, by the way, that whole area, it's a nice area. It's very beautiful. So there's like a lot of visitors there to that area of the country. Well, it's it's the third most visited city in uh, in Georgia, actually. It, it, I think it got four million visitors um, last year. Hell, Helen, Georgia. Yeah, Helen, Georgia. So like, so like, what is it? There's Atlanta, Savannah, Augusta. Yeah, and Helen. No one and really Hel visits other cities, basically. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. How many hotel rooms all together in Helen, Georgia, with four million visitors? <laughs> I don't, I don't know, but enough to make good money um, uh -huh. off of it. Um, so we get this, we're running it, and um, we invest all of our money basically into it. And it's going very, 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 very well. And eventually, after the first year, we find a couple to run it for us. They live on site. They handle everything. <laughs> okay? So I've taken myself off of that business but the money keeps coming in. Because when I first started, like I would work my ass off. If I can say that online, I would yeah, work. Yeah. I, no one worked harder than myself and my wife. I'll say that straight up. But what happens is once you get to a certain level of success, like the snowball keeps rolling. And when you can stick other people in these positions and the snowball keeps rolling, that's when you make generational wealth. Okay. So we stuck the people there and they're running it. Everything is going well. And uh, I started looking for other properties. I'm constantly, you know, following Zillow. I'm still sending mailers to people. I find nine cabins in Helen. It's an older guy also. Uh, he hates taxes. Uh, really cool guy, actually. <laughs> I looked and at those, the Airbnbs. You sent me the link. They were beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, man. Um, yeah, we we love those. Um, so I talked to like I like uh, I think like, man, why don't you just why don't you just leave? like I tried to get owner finance from him again, but we got a, a a lease option, which is a little bit more risky. So we had to put down, uh, I think it was fifty thousand, 
to get the lease option. And then after two years, um, we have to exercise the option to purchase. Okay. So it's a little risky, you know, if I right, can't you're 50, come up, at risk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if I can't get the money back, you know, but you see the upside there and you got to go for it. You know, once yeah. you, you're in business, when you see that, that window opening, you gotta, you gotta go for it. Well, how, how much do you think you could rent all nine out for? Well, I'll tell you what we did the first month. Mm -hmm. So we, we purchased them on the first of the month and I went ahead and put them on Airbnb. <laughs> okay. And, um, the first month we I, I would have put down 40 or 50,000. I can't remember, but the first month we grossed 22,000. Wow. Off the properties. And again, this was a guy that did, never put them on Airbnb, never put them on Verbo. He would just take each call from the people. So he's happy with the price I'm offering him. I'm, I'm letting him move to Florida, be with his family, and I'm giving him a check every single month. Well, oh, be, you're, is he getting the profits? What, how, does this, how does it work out? Like I offered him, I said, listen, man, I will give you $2,500 a month. 2,300 goes to principal and 200 goes to uh, insurance. And he said, okay, that sounds good. I said, okay. <laughs> so, so what interest though, how are you paying the interest to him? Or, or you're not paying interest. You just have the option. Yeah. So, so I'm paying him 2,500. That's what he gets. Once I exercise the option to purchase, I deduct 2,300 of the monthly payment out of the purchase price. Right, because you're paying that off every month. Yeah, and then the 200 interest goes to him just with pocket, basically. Yeah. So he's happy. Uh, I'm happy. And we're churning out this, this income and from the property. your risk is minimal. After like three months, you have no more risk. You took the risk off the table. Yeah, yeah. So right when this happens was when COVID hit, okay? <laughs> so COVID hit and the city shut down all of the, the hotels in the, in the city for a month. And I'm, I'm, I'm freaking now. I'm, I'm crying. I mean, we're going to lose our property. Oh my God. Oh, we've worked so much. And then after they opened up after 30 days, all of the people <laughs> were trapped in the U S basically. And they wanted to travel and they were getting this federal money from the, uh, from the government. And James, I, I kid you not, we were sold out almost every single day for two years straight. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like, I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James daily fantasy sports made easy.
the future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Wow. So while you were going through those 30 days, though, and you were very upset, like, were you optimistic things were going to open up? I mean, I know you must have imagined worst case scenarios, but did you also try imagining best case scenarios? Like, what was, what kind of like held you through? And I know it was just 30 days, but but it's very stressful. What I originally did was I started renting out each room in the hotel to traveling nurses. Hmm. So I would call all the local hospitals and I'd say, do you need a place to rent? I have uh, sanitized these hotel rooms. You can rent, um, no security deposit, just come in and rent them. There's a lot of people, like, this is kind of my pet peeve. Maybe you, you already know this about me, but I cannot stand when people victimize themselves. Hmm. Okay? Okay, COVID's here. Yeah, oh my God, my life is so terrible. Do something about it. Okay? <laughs> Don't just sit there actively work to resolve the issue. So I did the math and I said, I realized that if I rent out half of my hotel, the traveling nurses, I can more than cover my, uh, uh, my mortgage payment. Right. So I did that and I, I slept soundly at night and I did the same uh, calculation with the cabins. If I have to rent it to retired couples that are getting a social security payment, I can rent that. I could. I can uh, cover my mortgage payment on these cabins, so that's fine. I'm from the long term rental business, so I I know that business. Mm. Um, I know what I can do. So we we bought this the cabins, and um, we're bringing in twenty, thirty, forty thousand a month uh, gross, which is man, I'm just, I'm loving it just from the cabins. Okay. Mm. I'm doing flips. I'm doing properties on the side too, just to keep myself busy basically. And this brings me towards the, uh, the creativity of real estate. I know you came with businesses. I know you can tweak the numbers, but 
it is so creative, James. There's so much you can do um, to not pay taxes, to make it a win-win-win for everybody. So there's a property in LJ. Someone responded back to me about, so I'm sending out letters to foreclosures. I'm sending out letters to tax delinquents. And this person responds to like, hey, I'm about to get foreclosed on. She forgot she had this property. She thought it was foreclosed on. It was one of like the zombie mortgages of 2007, 2008. So she hasn't been paying for like six years. Okay. <laughs> she's like, I'm about to be foreclosed. What can you give me? Like, well, what do you owe? She owed, uh, I think it's 159, 159,000. I said, listen, I will give you $5,000 and I will pay off the mortgage. Is that good? And she was, she was so happy. She thought she lost the property. Hmm. So I bought this property in LJ, three bedroom, two bath cabin in um, a really nice area in the mountains. I pay her off. I pay off the, um, the liens on the property and uh, we want to Airbnb it. It doesn't make sense because it's, it's, it's a HOA and we would have to pay, I think it's like $40 a month to the HOA per person. This doesn't make, this doesn't make economical sense. Mm. So we decided to flip the property. So we put in, bought it for 164. We put in about $40,000 and we stuck it on the market. And for three ninety nine sale price. Wow. And within seven days, we got a, a full asking price of the property and we netted right below 200. So what I do with this money is I stick it into a 1031 exchange. It used to be called a Starker exchange. If you're familiar with that? No. Okay. What you can do when you get with the profits from real estate, you can put that into a like kind exchange, 1031, and you can invest that into another piece of property and you pay zero income tax on that. I didn't know that. Yeah, so seeing that we were lease optioning the cabins, we don't quote unquote own them. So <laughs> at the end of the term, I barreled in that 200,000 into the cabins and I saved all of the income from the cabins and paid 0% taxes. And once I exercised the lease to purchase them, I paid them off in cash. And so now all this income it's just like gravy. All the renting it out is just gravy. It's it's basically all to the. Um, I mean, I'll I'll tell you what we brought last year. If you pinky promise not to tell anybody, I won't tell but... a single soul. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just from the cabins, we brought in four ten, um, four hundred ten thousand for the T twelve, which is that's a lot of money to me. <laughs> and like this is all. I, this is a, a great thing because it really is. There's there's several things. One is you were totally starting from scratch, like zero dollars. And it's all a matter of a lot of times you were just like pre-selling something you didn't have. You would tell an investor, hey, what would you pay for this house? Then you would go out and buy the house cheaper, like on an auction or whatever, and then yeah. flip it immediately. So almost zero risk on your part. Like you had the money ready and 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 that's we see that kind of story a lot among entrepreneurs, like kind of fix the deal first, and then you're able to hustle and do these types of flips. But also you were driving to each house. You were looking for people who were in trouble, like with the tax liens and, and evictions and so on. Now in New York city, there was a, an eviction moratorium so that, yeah. you know, people who were renting were, didn't have to pay rent all of a sudden. And a lot of like mom and pop landlords went out of business because, you know, the, the renters stopped for 18 months, didn't pay any rent. But nothing in, was like that in Florida or Georgia. I guess that's a, a risk. I'll try to keep the politics aside <laughs> of that. But um, I guess in, there was like, a national eviction moratorium. There, there was a national, but it what if I remember correctly, it was only for government-backed loans. Hmm. So I had an owner of finance. So I could, if I needed to, I could evict them. But what I did is I called each one of my tenants. I said, listen... <laughs> I don't have the money for you not to pay for my mortgage, <laughs> you know, not to pay your rent. If you stop paying, I'm going to get foreclosed and you're going to get evicted anyway. I called every one of my tenants. I just explained to them because I, I was nervous, man. I, when it first hit, I was nervous. I said, listen, I, I need you guys to pay your, your rent. And they were all very, they were all very respectful, but they were getting money. They were getting more than me. I mean, they were getting money from the state. They were getting a payment for each one of their dependents, people in the family, and also the federal money. 
So one of one of the people they were bringing in like five or six k a month. One of wow. our apartments. So they were they were doing fine, man. Yeah, they. <laughs> I didn't know that, there was that much bailout. Like, did you, have you ever had to evict a tenant? I have. Most of that is my fault though. When I don't do my homework, you know, if I've really spend the time and uh, take the time to find the right tenant, then we're not going to have, you know, we're not going to have issues. I, I think 95% of the people, if you, re- if you treat them with respect, they're going to respect you also. And like, what, what was this, an instance where you didn't do your homework? Like, what kind of homework do you have to do? <laughs> oh, that's going to be a good one. Um, so I told you my dad was a pastor growing up. There was a girl that went to my, my dad's uh, youth, youth group, and I rented her the place without doing my due diligence on her. And, uh, yeah, it was terrible. Um, yeah, it was terrible. (laughs) Um, but again, that was my fault. It doesn't matter if they go to our church, you know, you have to. What would you have found out if you had done your due diligence on her? Oh man, I pulled, I pulled up her, I did a background check on her and it was, it was just so bad. (laughs) She'd been evicted for like seven places continuously. Uh, Again, though, that was my fault. You know, with all these things, you learn lessons. Like one time, <laughs> I got, I got, I'll, I'll do a quick, a quick, uh, terrible story yeah. also. One time, um, uh, my wife found the property and uh, <laughs> my wife found a property uh, facing a river, beautiful view. And it was $23,000. I was like, gosh, we'll buy it. Yeah, let's get it. Let's get it. So we bought it for cash. And what she didn't show me was that it was surrounded by like a hood on both sides. So I'm out of town and I come back and we start fixing it up and whatnot. And we're sitting there and we're still fixing the properties on our own. And we're sitting there on a little inflatable mattress, you know, sleeping at night. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. Gunshots are ringing out Uh (laughs) in the lot right next to us. Apparently there was like a gang war going on. And I I bought this property. It's like, Raleigh, what are you doing (laughs) Um, so I sold that and that was another lesson that I, were you able to sell it? Like, how were you able to sell it? Yeah. I sold it from an investor that bought the property right next to us. Ah. He was trying to, um, like improve the whole area, which is a pretty cool idea. Like I would have entertained that also, but that was another lesson that I only buy properties in the best areas. Okay. It could be a, like a rundown property, but in an A plus area, I'm getting it. If it's an A plus property in the hood, I'm, I am not touching it. And like the more successful you get, I think the more higher your um, uh, your needs uh, rise. Because like when I first started, man, I would buy anything. Okay, I was offered a property for free if I'll just pay the taxes. So like, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll buy anything. <laughs> um, put in money. You know, total just terrible property. But as you mature as an investor, you learn where your own money's at, and it's not buying in the hood. <laughs> Do you think it's still possible for people to look up like, oh, you know, who, which properties are being foreclosed from taxes? And you think it's possible to, even it's just, though it's just been 10 years, do you think that kind of environment still exists? Was it still easier back then? Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Was it easier then? Like, is it harder now? Like what, what adjustments would you have to make if you were starting right now? I would only go to states that are more uh, Republican leaning because if you do have an eviction, you can get them out of there in two weeks. Yeah. You know, in California, New York, <laughs> Good luck. it's a different ball game. Yeah, yeah. it's a different ball game. I you mean, what's going to happen to what's going to happen in New York or 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 California where, you know, you have all these people who I mean, the the judges aren't even showing up for court. They all quit their jobs. So there's like there's 800,000 people in eviction courts and there's no judges and everybody's going to go out of business who who well, I mean, look, look at the amount of people that are leaving from California to Texas from New York to Florida. I mean, people vote with their feet. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, again, I, I would only stay in a, in a Republican state, but that being said, if you work your ass off, you can do this anywhere. Is it, is it you know, you, you visit one property and you get $40,000? No. If you visit 100 properties, sooner or later, you're going to get a deal. <laughs> One thing I want to say too, I want to touch on, I don't want to get too chess nerdy, but 
uh, a couple of year. <laughs> oh, we were talking about this time. before. We were talking about this before the podcast, by the way. So for people listening, Roy and I are in an ongoing match. It's pretty. It's it's like we play. It's about forty minutes each side, so it's like an hour a game, a little more than an hour a game, and it's we're tied now eight to eight. Like in the last sixteen games we played, it's been a, it's been a match to the death. <laughs> The scary part is James is getting better with each game we play. So <laughs> I don't know. I lost the last game we played. So, but it was tricky. It was a tricky game. That was a fun game. I think with more with more time though, you would have draw that or won that. After I played uh, rugby seven, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have missed that. Um, it, it, that was, it looked that was like, careless. I mean, it looked like in the computer, like the last five six moves were like dead draw. Like at any yeah. point, there was like repetitions. And then I, I did blunder and make a mistake and you played well and took advantage of it. So, so you won fair and square, but, but it, it was, I thought I was winning and you thought you were winning. And so we weren't going to go for the draw. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I'll take, I'll take anything I can get with you, James. <laughs> I don't know about anything. that. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, what I want to say is like a couple of years back, you have to follow your style. You know, with real estate and chess. A couple of years back, I I decided that I was going to become a positional chess player. So I switched the Caro Can. I switched to the Queen's Pawn Accepted. I was playing like the boringest openings. And I, I did that for almost a year straight. And I was getting destroyed, James. <laughs> I, I'm too aggressive, you know, yeah. my playing style. I would just get annihilated by these little kids, which I should not be losing to. But wait, um, not to get chess nerd here, but you play that B3 Kings Indian. That's that's pretty positional. It's hard to like, you're, you're, you're not really going to get listen, a big attack on the queen You leave side. my B3 Kings Indian out of this. Okay? All right. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's not the most aggressive opening, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree. I agree. It's just so, the, the B3 Kings Indian is so, it's so weird. It's so tricky. Yeah, it's um, nice because it's not nobody's prepared for it. That's what's nice about it. It's like when you when you go into the teeth of the King's Indian, it's so hard just to stop the 98 or 97 F5, yeah. just sacrifice on H3 with the bishop. And it's just, man, you can get run off the table. And when someone plays King's Indian, they're coming for your throat. You know, they, yeah. they're coming, they want blood. No, B3 throws play, them off. Like you the first time we yeah. played that, you you crushed me with that. Yeah, yeah. And then you won the second one, I remember, with that um the pawn sacrifice on uh, Yeah, we, we played a, we played a whole bunch of those with that. And now I don't now I don't get into that line anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you have to follow like what's your um everyone has a, a certain area expertise, you know, in business and chess and real estate. And once you go against that green is when things start to go differently. Once I switch back to the Sicilian, you know, the Benoni, uh the Banco. These cre- these aggressive defenses is when like my rating started to uh, to rise again. Um, so so with business though, how do you find out what your style is until you kind of fail a bunch of times and and it's expensive to fail in business? Well, that that's, I mean, you have to fail. <laughs> yeah. Show me someone that's successful that hasn't failed. That's what I'm gonna. Uh, one one thing I, I dislike about our um, public school system. Is that they tell you that it's you know, A, B, C, or D, the answer. That's the right answer. And you and I know that in business, it's not black or white, it's a shade of gray. Yeah. That without failing, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna become successful <laughs> to a certain degree. What one thing I want to say too, you have to go against the green to a certain degree. Like when I was buying real estate, when I in my 20s, no one was buying real estate. Uh, I would rent properties to my my classmates in high school, to my friends, which I won't do again, but that was a mistake. But once you learn the rules in business and in real estate, then you can break them, okay? My senior year in high school, I went to uh, South America with, with student exchange. So I, I lived there for a year and I learned Spanish. What I did was I left one credit before graduating high school. So I had one credit left before coming back. So I came back after my senior year and I was able to dual enroll in the community college. In Florida, dual enroll students, their classes are 100% paid for by the government. Okay? So I'm taking, I'm, I got 20 credits for, first, uh, for the three semesters. I'm pumping out as many credits as I can. It's 100% paid for 
by the government because I'm a quote, high school student still. So it's these little tweaks mm. like that yeah, where you can play the system. Did you know you would be able to play the system that way? Like that's why you left one credit going? Yeah, from yeah, yeah. I, 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 that was my strategy is that why am I going to go to yeah, for a whole excellent. year when I can, I think I saved, I think it's 20, 20 or $30,000 doing that. Why, why do they do that for high school students? Like what's the principle about? Any, any high school student can enroll in um, dual enroll. You have to take a, a test in college courses. So I don't know why more, more parents don't do that. Um, yeah. I, I think like, so I was homeschooled, but I was like normal homeschooled. <laughs> but like being homeschooled until, until high school, you're always a little bit different. Okay. So you always, you're, you're kind of always going against the grain. So like when I got to high school, I was a little bit different. Do you have any trouble acclimating like in high school, like do, like socializing and stuff like that? A little bit, a little bit. Um, I played sports, so I just hung out with my, my sports buddies. Yeah. Um, without that, yeah, I probably would have been that weird homeschooler, you know, like picking his boogers in the, <laughs> in the back of the classroom. Because like I see all my friends, they would go to the four-year university. They graduate with twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 of debt. But doing this, having the first year paid for, I got the, um, what was it, Pell Grant? I got some sort of grant where they pay for 90% of my tuition, which is not hard to get. It's, a, it's from the Florida Lotto, okay? So seeing that I had all this first year of credits already paid for, <laughs> they would pay me a semester payment of the, that cost of credits, so all my friends are, in, are going into debt. And I'm, I was receiving, I think, 4000 4, a semester of pure cash via check. And it's one tweak. Yeah. But it shapes your whole life. So I graduated with zero school debt. And I'm, I, hit, I hit the ground running, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, and, and what's... You've been expanding, expanding, expanding. You've got all these properties. You're generating, you said, uh, 410 uh, in rent per year or last year. What's... Next, like how far can you take this? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I really... What would be like a big dream now? Like what would be a reach? I want to get in. A mistake that I did make um, when I first got it started is I kind of went, went around it as like a lone wolf. I would, I would wholesale the properties to the investors, but I wouldn't really partner with them. Um, what we were talking about that business previously, remember uh, during our match, when you said you can make a fund, you could gather yeah. money and invest into this. And if I would have done that earlier, I would, I would have been 10 times higher. Right. Because you could get all these investors who now you could still do it. Like all these investors now trust you. They've made money with you. And you could say, listen, and you could start slow. You could say, listen, I'm putting together a million dollars. I'm going to do what I've always been doing. And now you guys get 80% of the profits. I'll take 20% of the profits. And then you start with that. You show a good tracker. Then you raise 10 million. Then you raise 100 million. So that's one route to go. I could see myself getting into that. If you have any uh, listeners that work in, in that type of um, real estate, feel free to reach out. I'd love to connect with them. There is so much money to be made. But it's, it's not about the money. It's about the freedom yeah. that comes from the money. But let me ask you this, like right yeah. now, right now is a very interesting time because we have this crazy environment that is fueled maybe by the pandemic bailouts and federal stimulus and also, but combined with that, now we have the, the Fed raising rates and real estate's been all over the place. But in general, like in a stagflation economy, real estate tends to be a good investment because particularly if you're paying cash and you're not borrowing money at higher interest rates, yeah. housing prices are a little down, but eventually they go back up. Like they, housing prices never go down as much as like mortgages go up. So eventually they pop, housing pops back up. And, and you're right, Georgia, for instance, it's a very stable, you know, like during the pandemic, prices didn't really go down. And when it, people started moving here, may, they went up a little, but not as much as like Florida, which like doubled in, in a month when people were moving oh, there. Florida's crazy. Florida's yeah. crazy. I was originally looking in Florida to buy, but it was it was scary because you'd look at a place and like every month it was like 10% higher and it, it, it was insane. And then I looked at Tennessee actually, didn't like it, but Georgia looked like it was up and coming. I saw that a lot of people from New York were moving here 
and that prices yeah. were still fairly stable with where they were before the pandemic. So, so it seems like now is actually a good time to buy real estate. And, and they say it's not, I agree. The prices are ridiculously high. If we look back at 2010, but everything's high compared to 2010, yeah. but it's not timing. It's not timing the market. It's time in market. With the way that the U.S. dollar <laughs> is becoming cheaper and cheaper, you need to put your money in hard assets. And the business we were talking about when we had our uh, our match, I put in an offer yesterday on. By the way, and the broker says she'll own or finance eighty percent of the loan. Hmm. I mean, that's that's a lot of money. And th- uh, another thing is incredible with what's happening right now is. That baby boomer generation, I mean, the biggest generation we've had in the U.S., what's happening with them? They're all retiring. So these properties that these people have held for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, they're retiring (laughs) and they're selling off these these properties. You you see this in the um, RV parks. You see this in the um, apartment complexes. These mom and pop shops. They're selling and oftentimes they're selling with, with owner carry. Yes, interest rates are high right now. But if you can get a solid asset with 10% down, 20% down, and the owner carrying the, the remaining portion, it's a no-brainer. Um, I, I would love to get into uh, the com- or more the commercial side and the development side. Is there a commercial side? Because like take malls, for instance, it feels like malls and that includes maybe strip malls or outdoor malls are like out of business because everybody buys goods from Amazon and you don't even really, unless people just want to go out and spend time in a restaurant, you don't need to go to a restaurant for the food of that restaurant. Everybody delivers. For malls, for an example, what you can do is you could purchase that and repurpose them as a uh, storage facilities. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much you've researched storage, but they are, ju- they're, cash cows, the amount of money they push off is ridiculous. Why? Because people have junk (laughs) and they they need to put their junk somewhere. Yeah. They don't get rid of it. They'll pay a hundred, two hundred dollars for a storage facility for something that costs a hundred, two hundred dollars. People are such attached to things and the things end up controlling them for like almost three months. I just threw away my my clothes and wore like two or three shirts. Just the amount of less time that yeah. you spend, you know, like you're going to look fine. You know, if you're married, you already won. You know, you don't have to yeah, be right, like you're done. <laughs> Mr. Sexy, you know, like I right. won the race. You know, right. I kind of have a pet theory where I try to keep my decision making to a minimum. Like I'll have the same thing for breakfast every single morning. I'll have this, I'll wear the same thing just to really focus on the real decisions, you know, that need to be made. I mean, how much, how many real decisions do you make per day in the sense that like you've got this money coming in and and you're looking for your next opportunities. You're like looking at businesses to buy and so on. Like how much would you say you, you put into this per day now? I mean, not much at all. Um, so we have the couple that helps run the hotel and that's bringing last year it grossed over 500, the hotel mm-hmm. only. Then we have a cleaner that handles our cabins. And then we have a handyman that just works on our hotel cabins. And then we, if we have a property, we're flipping the whole go and work on that. I mean, I'm just studying chess right now. I'm just, I'm just preparing for our next match with you, James. <laughs> I know you're going to have to study hard because I'm getting ready, but <laughs> uh, you're, 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 you're bicycling across India starting this weekend, right? Yeah. And like the, the fact that I can do, do that is just like so stupid to me. The fact that, and what one thing I want to touch on is that it's not about like the money, okay? It's about the freedom to be with my four-year-old son. You know, yeah. we woke up, we went to the zoo, we went to the park. It's because because we wanted to. Do you know how few people have that that freedom? You know, it just. It's, I mean, I'm so that's, thankful. That's the one thing where if you take it, let's say you want to take it a lot higher, and you want to put together a fund and you want to buy bigger businesses, that might limit your freedom, actually. Like sometimes going for too much money limits the freedom. Oh, yeah. yeah. The money controls you. And I've had that. I've had that conversation with my wife and for myself, with myself several times. Yeah. It's not work to me. (laughs) 
you know, I can't, I can't just sit there and just be like, Oh God, I'm so, you know, this, this is so great. I have to, I, I have to be working on some business. It's like a position, you know, a chess board, you know, after our games, we could sit there for 20 minutes and just analyze yeah. the position. It's the same thing with business. Like we're, I sit and I analyze, how, how, could, how can we make this work? What bolts could we turn, get this funding to work? How could we make it go, you know, 2X? How could we, what minor little changes could we do? I, 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 I love this stuff. And it's not work to me. Like one of the proudest moments was my, uh, my son, uh, he's four years old. He opened up a store in our house because he wants to be a business owner. Oh, that's, like, good. I, 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 <laughs> that's good education. You know what I used to do is I used to take my kids around like to like, let's say we would go down Main Street of a town and look at every store. And there's like always a lot of weird stores started by random people. And I would, I would ask my daughter, is this store going to stay in business? Why or why not? Is this store going to stay in business? Why or why not? And like, I remember there was one store called Balls and Dolls. And what they did was they sold dolls and like basketballs. And she, and she was like five or six years old. And she said, this doesn't make any sense at all. Like, who's shopping here? Like the dolls weren't even that interesting to her. You, so, you, you've read you've read the E-Myth, right? No, I haven't read the E-Myth. Oh, okay. But same exact thing. Someone that loves, you know, balls and dolls, they want to open up a business, but they don't know the business. Like once you work on your business, you can systematize it and do what you really love, you know? Yeah. Thank God I love real estate. But if I love the counting, I could do the same thing. You have to fine tune that business. Put, um, what's the, uh, the book, uh, Who Not How? Uh, you you would love that book. You probably know everything. Uh, no, no, I, you mentioned two books I haven't read. I'll have to look at that. Who Not How is a good title. Yeah, and it says it's not... Um, it's not a, it's getting the right people on the bus and then figuring out where you're taking the bus. If you get the right people on you in your business, you can take it anywhere. Like, um, once you know business, you can do anything. I mean, you could sell. No, it's true. And there are a lot of nuances that people don't understand. Like when I first started in business, there were, I knew, I wish I had known more. Like I would have made a lot more money just because it was, I was, I was, first in the business in the very first internet boom. And mm -hmm. there were so many, I did well in it, but there were so many mistakes I made that I just, I didn't understand the nuances of business. I did not know anything about business. I just knew I had a, a, a service I could provide building people's websites that they yeah. needed. But I didn't, but, so I thought that was business was selling a service that people needed, but there's so much more that's two dimensional way of looking at it. There's a three, three dimensions though, or four dimensions if you throw in time yeah. and I just, I wish I had known then what I know now, because I, I would have done much better. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm trying, I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything. Although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works travels and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com.
this is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. Knowing now what you know, what step forward would you take if you were in my position? I would think, I mean, you started in the beginning with the concept of other people's money. And mm -hmm. that almost sounds, I don't, I actually don't like the phrase when I say other people's money, it sounds like you're taking advantage, but they made yeah. money, you made money and the people who were selling to you, you know, it relieved their stress and, and saved them. So figuring out more ways to use other people's money but the downside of that is then you have to talk to a lot of people all the time. You're not as free. You might not be able to yeah. go for a month to India bicycling because <laughs> there's investors who want to talk to you every now and then. Yeah. And yeah. so it's tricky. I don't know if I would do anything differently, really. Maybe the other thing you can always do is, you know, take 50% of what you have and not sell it, but allow people to benefit from it. Like if they give you, you know, like right now, a decent mm -hmm. interest rate for anybody to get would be like eight or 9% a year. So you could say, look, if you give me, you could, you could take your, let's say you're making a hundred thousand a month in rent. Okay. You could say, look, I'm going to sell off $40,000 a month of this cash flow for, mm -hmm. well, let's say 40,000 a year. I could sell off that cash flow to people. If they give me, um, yeah. you know, 400,000, mm -hmm. they make 10%. So now you're not selling anything. Like you still own a hundred percent of everything. Yeah. You got four hundred thousand dollars cash up front, and you just have to give forty thousand a month. You know, you have to share that your 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 rent with people. So that's the other way. There's all sorts of like structures you could set up, which which you probably know, and that's that's better. You're not taking on any debt, and you, you're. I mean, yeah, they would want their four hundred thousand back eventually, but you can do say it's like a ten year holding period, and uh, there's all sorts of like structures you could do to. Now that the fact that you have actual cash flow, there's many things you can do with that. Yeah. And the yeah, track yeah, record, yeah. you could raise money if you wanted to do a fund. Uh, but I don't know if that's what you would want to do. Like that's stressful also. And again, you have to deal with a lot of, a lot of people. You'd have to really pick your partners wisely. What, um, but I like the self storage, uh, idea, like going into the storage was, <laughs> cause then you don't have to deal with tenants and it's, it's, it's impossible for that business to go down. Like there are more people in the U S every year. There's only so much land, you know, most major urban areas are fully developed. So it's limited storage space and more and more people needing it. I've researched that business quite a bit and it's so much, um, so much, uh, work, less work intensive from even apartments and, and hotels. What, um, 
what the trip to India is now is kind of like um how do I recalibrating my, yeah. my mind. Okay. It's <laughs> so, like we worked very hard to get the um get the cabins to pay them off completely. And now I'm taking this trip, I'm coming back kind of to, to think what what's the plan going forward? You know, what what is the next goal? Because I I've reached all my goals. My my original plan was to own 20 doors. And now we own over 40. What about like, um, like, you, you know, you're in places like Helen, Georgia, just a little bit north is Gatlinburg, which is, you know, Tennessee, 15 million visitors a year. It's, I think it's yeah. like the most, I had never even yeah. heard of this place before. And it's the most visited. It's like more visited than, you know, Yellowstone National Park or uh, uh, Disney World for all I know. I don't know. Yeah. And, and there's only so many hotel rooms and campgrounds. It seems like favorable economics in the campground business or the glamp ground business in yeah. that area, which is not so far yeah. away. And yeah. again, prices are down now because of mortgage rates. But if you're able to do like cash deals, that, that seems like an interesting place to look. Yeah. I think it's going to take a little while for the, um, for the sellers to realize that the prices are down now because yeah. they're still kind of living off that hysteria of the, uh, the prices are keep rising. Um, that's another reason I want to take this trip is kind of just see where everything will be, you know, in, in two months. Um, we're in a very interesting time with, yeah. with the war in, um, in Ukraine, with our economy. Uh, they say Turkey might invade Syria here soon. Oh, I um, didn't hear that. Is, yeah. Yeah. It's just a very uh, interesting time. That's why I'm very happy to have paid off most of our real estate. And if we need to refinance, you know, and jump on to um, another deal, we we can do that. And and how much of your business is Airbnb as opposed to long term rentals? Okay, we have thirteen uh, Airbnb cabins. Um, the hotel, which is twenty, then we have the six unit uh, apartment complex. I still have. So we paid off in two years, I think. And and by the way, that is that Airbnb or is that long term rental? No, long term, long term. But that's in Daytona. Like I would think Airbnb would be hot, like in the summer months or in, in spring break, you know? <laughs> yeah, because it's uh it's uh it's banned. <laughs> oh, is in Daytona? County. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Airbnb is not allowed. Yeah, it, in Volusia County, it's banned. Um I would think but I'm bringing it lean up there. <laughs> yeah. I'm bringing in almost five thousand gross there and over almost six thousand. And then I have a a uh, a single family. And they never call me. Like I just keep the I keep I know I know the going rates there. I know what they're renting for, but my nothing is worth my time like as much as my time. If I can keep the rents a little bit lower than market, and they'll fix an issue, that that's great. Um, which is just a, a blessing from God. <laughs> so when we have an issue, we'll drive down there, spend a week at the beach with my family, and fix uh, the unit, which is just amazing. So it's funny. Like you asked me what I would do if I were you. Again, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would do anything. Like these past <laughs> seven years for me, I mean, I keep involved in business and I make investments and so on. But for seven years, I did stand up comedy every single day. Like that's what I was, what I yeah. loved and what I focused on. And I still had like businesses running, but I just didn't spend that much. I was able to set it up like you were, like not, not spend so much time on them. And then lately, of course, I've been studying chess and all along I've been doing writing. So these things don't yeah. make money really, but it's so much. I, and I think to myself sometimes, Hey, maybe in 2015, I should have started a business instead of yeah. going up on stage every night in front of a bunch of drunk strangers. And I would have, you know, done this or I had done that and made a ton of money from that. But it's, you only live life once. So when else are you going to do these things you love? When else are you going to bicycle around India for a month or two? Like <laughs> you're not going to do it when you're 80 and yeah, you got to yeah. do it now. And then when you're 80, yeah. you're not going to want to run a business. So well, I'll go talk to all my kids, how cool I was back, uh, back in the day. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. my fear now only is that I ever, I, I ever lose, you know, the ability, like people you also wonder how are we ever going to compete with AI and the, and yeah. The one answer really is if you live an interesting life, you're going to, AI can't compete with that. Like AI cannot make up your life. Like, AI could re repeat, like, you know, could tell the story of a boring life, but it's never going to make up your life. If you're, if you're doing unique experiences and having adventures and so on. And you know, the, the best way to do that is just pursuing things you love. 
And something AI can't repeat is a human connection. Yeah. Okay. A, a conversation one on one with a person when, like, you're, I don't know what is the energy or this, the minds connect, you know, like when you're problem solving, try, even when we're trying to solve a position, yeah. we almost always find the best move when we're, we're talking together because it's both of our heads working for a common goal, which is just so yeah. cool to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And like, look, and, and then there's, you know, like, like Friday, we played in that tournament and so we get there i didn't know you were going to be there brad was going to be there andrew was going to be there like and you see you, you build community around the things that you're interested in and yeah. you know that like i ran a, a hedge fund once and it was like i had about 15 investors all like really annoying wealthy people who you know they wouldn't call me for 12 months in a row and then the one month yeah. i was a half a percent down they were like what's happening are you are you a fraud like what's going on and mm -hmm. Just annoying. Whereas my my life is much less stressful than when all I thought about was money. Even though I probably would have made more money if I had stuck to just building businesses and and things like that. So I don't know if I would do anything differently. Sounds like you got a pretty good thing going on. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the amazing things is that like once you see this um, torn apart house, this uh, terrible looking. Once you invest the time and just to make it make it a home again, it's one of the most amazing feelings you, you can get in your life. Probably similar to the way you do it with businesses, how you develop. It's like a child, basically, where you just yeah, bring it to uh, maturity. I just, oh, I love it. Yeah, and then you sell it to a happy family that wants to live there, and they're gonna like build their life around this place that you just, you know, creatively bought and then built up. And yeah, I'm sure that's great. So, where where, where do you see yourself? going in the next five years because you've kind of you, you're kind of, you basically were where i strive to be you already were you, you are uh, a 2200 chess master you've been successful with businesses you've been successful in new york where having been where i want to be where do you see yourself going i honestly don't know i mean i really i just want to keep it interesting without without sacrificing any of my values or principles or, yeah. you know, I don't want to have to, uh, you know, answer to people that I don't really like. And I, I right now enjoy everything that I'm doing. I'd like, I'd like to get to 2200 again. You know, everybody says, I'm, <laughs> everybody says I'm too old to do it, but I'm, I refuse to believe that. And, yeah. uh, and then I'm going to write a book about that experience so that I, I think I'd like to do more kind of teaching and educating. And, okay. you know, I, I revolve this podcast somewhat around that. And then I think my next book might go in that direction, particularly around the idea of adult learning, like learning to do things and be successful as, you know, over the age of 40 or over the age of 50 or whatever. Because I see like okay. in the pandemic, a lot of people were laid off. And right now, a lot of people are getting laid off and they want to pursue their passions. But everyone tells them the same thing they told me, which is, oh, no, you can't do that. You're too old for that. You know, you better get another job or whatever. And, but they can do it. It's just hard. Like, look, look how hard it is to get, like you have all these kids running around playing with their chess oh computers and then going to tournaments. They're, they're geniuses now. Little monsters. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew. Where's Andrew? Yeah, I got a monster. <laughs> like an 11 year old so, kid, like, who's just he's so good. mowing us down. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But Roy, thanks so much for going on the podcast. You're always welcome to come back on. And and where can people find you? Um, probably the easiest is uh, is Instagram. My uh, my name is Raleigh Weaver, spelled R O L L Y Weaver. Wait, how come I call you Roy? Um, well, that's my name. <laughs> okay, that's what you go so by. I, yeah, I'm I'm Roy Holland Weaver the fourth, huh. and and my son is the fifth. So my huh. my father was the third. Um, my grandfather was a second. So like, so there wouldn't be like a, a communication issues, like a family reunion saying Roy and all of us saying, oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, my my mom's name is Linda. So they combined my father and my mom's name uh, to Raw Lee, Roy Lee. Um, and so that's how they got uh, my name. But it's uh, Raleigh Weaver, R-O-L-L-Y Weaver, W-E-A-V-E-R at Instagram. Okay, great. All right. Well, that's where people can find you. And yeah, Roy, thanks again so much for, for, for coming on. Enjoy India. And then 
you better be brushing up on several of your lines. <laughs> I'm so terrified to play maybe, you when I come maybe back. Maybe not the obvious <laughs> ones also. So well, we'll I, have to well, see. I, I knew you were coming to the uh, Friday night tournament. So I booked up against you. And then, of course, you played the Stonewall. So yeah, like, come I on, never, James, man. That's so I, rude. I, I, I play with a different account that I don't have my name on to play new openings. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to keep you on, on your feet. Everyone, everyone's booking up on everyone else now. I got to keep learning new openings. <laughs> All right, man. Yeah, and I appreciate you again um, having me on here. And I appreciate you taking the time to um, just talk to me about business. Having your, your experience, um, it's just it's incredible just to watch how you carry yourself and whatnot. Uh, I love it. So I appreciate well, thanks it. A lot. Thanks a lot, Roy. And, and look, I, uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll see you right after you get back from, from India. There's lots of stuff going on in the, in the chess world. <laughs> All right, man. Good luck on Tuesday. Thank you. All right. In Tresto, Sucubitril Valsartan Tablets is the number one heart failure brand prescribed by cardiologists and has helped over one million people with heart failure. It's a prescription medicine that treats adults with long-lasting chronic heart failure and works better when the heart cannot pump a normal amount of blood to the body. Don't take Entresto if pregnant. It can cause harm or death to an unborn baby. Don't take Entresto with an ACE inhibitor or Alice Kieran. Or if you've had angioedema with an ACE or ARB. Don't take with Alice Kieran or within 36 hours of taking an ACE inhibitor. The most serious side effects are angioedema, low blood pressure, kidney problems, or high blood potassium. Angioedema is swelling of your face, lips, tongue, and throat that may cause death. If it causes difficulty breathing, get emergency help. Ask your doctor about Entresto. To learn more, visit support.entresto.com or call 833-446-6699. For pricing, visit entresto.com backslash cost. If you can't afford your medication, Novartis may be able to help. It's time to save. Clear the Rack is on at your Nordstrom Rack store. For a limited time, take an extra 25% off clearance. All sales are final. Hurry, shop this sale at Nordstrom Rack today. Please see NordstromRack.com or ask a store associate for details.